Hallelujah. Good morning. How are you all doing this morning? Do you feel like you've had church already? It's been good. I really appreciate our praise and worship team. They do an amazing job. And uh, yeah, give me a hand. I've tried to play an instrument in the past, and uh, I sing, but just by myself. My wife says I can't carry a tune. Hallelujah. So today, we're going to talk about his second coming. It's not something that you hear much about, but uh, we're going to dive into it today. And uh, if you have a Bible with you, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. The Gospel of John, chapter 14, we're going to look at verse 1 through 3. And before we get off into that, as you're turning, let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for today. I thank you for every person that's here present in this uh, auditorium. I thank you for everybody that's listening online. God, I ask that you give us, each one of us, ears to hear and hearts to receive what your Holy Spirit would say to us individually and corporately. God, I thank you for bringing to my remembrance every scripture, every illustration that you would have me to share. And God, we purpose to give you the glory and the honor for everything that's wrought here. We continue to invite your presence. And God, we just thank you for your goodness. It says in Exodus 34 that you are abundant in goodness and truth. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so. Let's look at John chapter 14. Now, in my Bible, it's got red ink, which lets me know that this is Jesus talking. And so he's talking to his uh, disciples there, and it says, let, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That sounds kind of personal, doesn't it? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, what did he say? I will come again. That's Jesus saying, I will come again. Now let me read you some some stats about his second coming. I thought this was fascinating. I I got this from a theological book, something was smarter than me. Uh, Jesus said that he would come again. His second coming is mentioned more than 300 times in the New Testament. More than 300 times. That means it is mentioned on average once in every 25 verses. Did you know that? In Paul's epistle, there are more than 50 references to the second coming of Christ. It's been said that there are eight times more verses concerning the second coming of the Lord than there are of those that concern his first coming. Did you know that? I didn't. It's all over the place. As a matter of fact, whole books and whole chapters are devoted to this subject. You can read in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. And also the book of Revelation. It's also in Matthew 24 and 25, which we're going to look at today. Mark 13 and Luke 21. Jesus himself often referred to his coming again and urged his followers to watch and to be ready. Now, this is not a message to scare you. This is a message of hope because the Bible says in the New Testament that we're supposed to comfort one another with this message, that he is coming again. Amen? In fact, there's about 50 times in the New Testament, about 50 times in the New Testament, believers are urged to be ready for the Lord to come again. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about three points if you're taking notes. Three points. The title of the message is His Second Coming. Point one is stay right, stay ready. That's the first point. Stay ready. The second point we're going to talk about is stay full. Stay full. And the third point we're going to talk about is stay busy. Stay busy. So stay ready. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 7, I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. Revelation, chapter 19, verse 7, is talking about the, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And it says that his wife, or his bride, has made herself ready. Well, who is the bride of Christ? We are. 
If you're a believer, you are the bride of Christ. And it says that she made herself ready. Now, not to pick on women, but often I can shower, get dressed, and be standing at the front door long before my wife is. But I appreciate everything that she does, you know? There's a lot of foofing, fluffing, and (laughs) makeup, and, and and I appreciate that. But it takes time, right? It takes time to get ready. So um, it says that his bride made herself ready. In the book of Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, (coughs) Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, again, he's talking about, uh, he's talking to the church there, and he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, if somebody's knocking at your door and you're not ready for them, what do you do? It's kind of like yesterday, We were sitting there in the afternoon and, you know, got up, didn't take a shower yesterday because I thought, well, we're going to be outside doing work. It's just kind of scuzzy. You ever been just scuzzy? Had some old work jeans on, old T-shirt. My hair was all just, you know, um, just felt greasy. And lo and behold, there's a knock at the door. Bum, 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 bum. I was like, the dog's barking. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And and so I told my wife, I said, go get the door. And I ran. We got a hat to put on, some shoes to put on. And it was a door-to-door salesman. Um, but you know what it feels like when somebody knocks at your door and you're not ready. It's embarrassing. I'm going to tell a story of my mom. So mom, if you're watching, I love you. Many years ago when I was a lot younger, um, we lived in a house in the woods um, in another state. And uh, my mom had a habit. I don't know if you remember those Playtex bra commercials, Playtex girdle commercials. Um, she had a habit of, you know, coming home and she'd just lounge around in her Playtex bra and her Playtex girdle and just infuriated my father. Marge, for God's sake, put some clothes on. You never know if somebody's going to come to that. She goes, oh, who's going to come to the house out here? We live in the woods. So he'd had enough of it one night. She'd come home and so she's sitting on the sofa. There's the fireplace, the TV. There's the front door right there. And so he comes to me, he goes, Dan, come here. I said, what? I love a good game. He said, I'm going to slip you out the window. You get on the front porch and give me just a minute. He said, look, get, let, let me get back in the living room, sit, sit next to your mother. And he said, then you knock on the door real loud. I said, okay. <laughs> so she's sitting in there in her Playtex bra and Playtex girdle. And all of a sudden, bam, 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 bam. He, he goes, I'll get it. She screamed, oh, God. I could hear her running through the house. I never saw her lounging around like that again. (laughs) Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. The question is, are we ready? Right? First step to being ready is that you got to believe. Amen? You got to be a believer. So if you're here and you're not born again, we're going to give you opportunity at the end of the service because you have to accept Jesus Christ into your heart. You don't get into heaven. You don't get to greet him at his second coming in, in a positive manner if you're not born again. And just because you went to church all your life doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you were born in America doesn't make you a Christian. Just because your parents are believers doesn't make you a Christian. Just because I'm the pastor of a church Many years ago, senior pastor, didn't make my children Christians. You have to accept Christ into your life, into your heart for yourself. And it's not a difficult thing to do. You just have to do like it says in the book of Romans, chapter 10, that you have to believe, you have to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus died for each one of our sins, and he was buried, and God raised him on the third day. And then you have to confess him with your mouth. You say, I believe, Lord Jesus, that you died for my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and save me and forgive me. It's pretty simple. But in order to stay ready, first of all, you got to believe. Amen? Let's turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 25. Matthew, chapter 25. Hallelujah. His second coming. He said that he was coming again. We ought to be excited about that, amen? 
So in this story, this is the parable of the 10 virgins. Now 10 is a significant number in the Bible. <clears throat> and we're gonna see this over and over again. But 10 represents one of many things, but one of it is testimony. Represents testimony. Everybody has a testimony, right? Something that you can talk about. It says in the book of Revelation that they, that they overcame them by their testimony, right? And the blood of the lamb. But these ten virgins, Jesus says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, because Jesus is tarrying, isn't he? He didn't come back yet. It says they all slumbered and slept. They fell asleep. Now that's significant. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. They didn't take enough oil. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and it says, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I don't know you. Watch, therefore. Now watch is the opposite of sleep and slumber. Right? Now, if you look up this word watch in the Greek concordance, Strong's concordance, the, the Greek word there, it means to stay vigilant, to stay alert, to be alert, to be awake. Now, it's talking, you know, I know in the natural here it says that they fell asleep, but I think so many times Christians spiritually have fallen asleep. We get lulled into the status quo well, life's always been this way, and we're going to see that in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, I think. But we'll look at that. Where it says that they said, you know, ever since the beginning, they've been talking about he's coming back. He hasn't come back yet. Everything just continues as it, we fall into this slumber spiritually. We get up. We go through a routine. We go to work, clean the house, whatever. He come home, eat some supper, watch a movie, mow the grass. Well, maybe not in the heat, but anyway... We get in this slumber. And the Lord's saying, you need to be vigilant. You need to stay alert. You need to be awake. You need to be watching, ever alert. He says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So we have to stay ready. You don't know when he's going to knock on the door. You don't know when you're going to hear that shout from heaven. Right? Now we, as believers... We have the Spirit of God in us, and so I believe that there will be this sensing, there will be this knowing. You begin to sense certain things, right? You won't know, know, necessarily know the day or the hour, but you'll know, I think, the timing, the, the season. And that gives us hope, amen? Hallelujah. <clears throat> now, also, there's an interesting story in the book of Numbers, chapter 14. You can read it on your own, Numbers, chapter 14. But basically, God had told them, he was trying to take them into the promised land. They sent in how many spies? 12 spies? How many came back with an evil report? 10. There's that number 10 again. Their testimony was bad. God said, I've given this land. They go in, spy it out. <clears throat> they come back and they said, we can't do it. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. They're, they're giants. And then there was Caleb and Joshua. It says they were of another spirit. They had a different testimony. They said, we are well able to go in and take the land. They believed. What did they believe? They believed the word of God. They believed what God said. For us to stay ready, we have to believe what God said. Jesus said, I will come again. And I read you some stats that say over and over again, he is coming again. So I would encourage us, I was amazed when I began to study it, because this is not something that I, I'm like, 
okay, I think I'm going to talk about this subject this Sunday, God. This was a couple of weeks ago before they even asked me to, uh, to minister. Uh, my wife was playing the piano one day, and I was sitting in the rocking chair and just kind of got lost, and boom, saw myself here. And I began to hear this message, and I thought, seriously? His second coming? I know nothing about that. I mean, I'm not a revelation kind of guy, you know? Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, it'll all pan out, right, kind of? <laughs> I stick to the nuts and bolts, you know, the basics. It's like, oh, Lord, you're going to have to help me with this message. Well, you have to stay ready. That means, first of all, you got to believe what he said. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came and he lived a sinless life, that he died for our sins for each and every one of us. It says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But to get saved, to become born again, because in John 3, 16, you know, Jesus was telling Nicodemus, you got to be born again. Otherwise, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. You're not even going to get into the kingdom of God. We have to believe God's word. And be ready for his second coming. Amen? So what was their testimony? Those five wise virgins and Joshua and Caleb, they believed what the Lord said. They believed the word of God. That was their testimony. Point number two, we have to stay full. Again, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 25. Um, You can open up there, verse 1 through 13, Matthew 25, talking about the uh, ten virgins. And so as you read through there, there's some things that they did. It says that they took lamps. What do lamps represent or symbolize in the Word of God? In Psalm 119, it says that God's Word is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our our path. It says the entrance of God's Word brings or gives light. So that lamp represents what? It represents the Word of God. It's amazing how many times when Jesus tells parables, tells stories, there's there's these metaphors in there. So the lamp represents the word of God. His word is a light for us to be able to see in this darkness that we live in. Y'all are shouting me down. The other thing was there was oil. What does the oil represent? The Holy Spirit, the anointing. In the New Testament, it talks about you have an anointing from him. And it says that he will teach you, and that coincides with John chapter 14, talking about the Holy Spirit, that he's called the spirit of truth, and that when he comes, he will abide in you, and you will know him, and he will teach you all things. He will lead you and guide you into all truth. He will show you things to come. So the oil there represents the spirit of God, the anointing of God, The lamp represents the word of God. And there was a third thing that they did, and that was that they watched. They were alert. They stayed awake spiritually. They were being responsible. I think sometimes as Christians, you know, I've come across some Christians, and I've been that way, where they were just not responsible, irresponsible. God's got the whole world in his hands. I can't sing it. He's got the whole world, he's in control. I'm just going to do my thing, flow through life. Hey, Sarah, Sarah. Just want to grab him and go, <laughs> wake up. Don't be so ignorant. There is a real devil. Heaven is a real place, and hell is a real place, and they both eternal. And when Jesus comes, there are things going to happen. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. I've worked with both sheep and I've worked with both goats as well with my dad. And man, they're a mess to work with. (laughs) But he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And it says in John chapter 3, 16, it also talks about the, those that refuse to believe, those that refuse to accept the free gift of salvation. It says that they are already condemned. God is not willing that anyone should perish. He is very long-suffering. He is merciful and gracious. It even says in the book of Isaiah that he's not willing that the wicked should perish. 
but that they should repent and turn from their wicked ways. I can't even imagine how much it must grieve God when someone who he's created and breathed life into comes in this life and they, they go all through this life and they never accept him or they reject him, they don't acknowledge him, and boom, they go into eternity, to damnation. That's a bad place. One time I came home and I was taking a nap from work and uh, we had had a guest speaker at our church and uh, um, anyway, I won't say who it was, but um, this is way, way back on Jackson Street. And as I was taking this nap, I was really tired. I had this vision, and in the vision, it was, it was in color. And it was just like, if you've ever seen um, volcanoes and the lava that comes out, just, that's what this looked like. And I was looking at it, and all of a sudden, I was trying to focus, and I realized it wasn't lava. It was people. And it was torment. They were in torment. I think the Lord allowed me to have a glimpse, small glimpse of hell. It says that there will be gnashing of teeth and wailing. You know, and, and you read the story that Jesus told the parable about the rich man and Lazarus. So that they went into Abraham's bosom, or, or Lazarus did, and the rich man went into Sheol or hell. And he's screaming over there, Father Abraham! Can you get Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and touch the tip of my tongue? Because he was in torment. Hell's a real place. I don't want to visit. And heaven's a real place. It's beautiful. I mean, there's many accounts nowadays on, on TV and on the internet about people that have died prematurely and gone to heaven and then God sent them back and they describe heaven. I was listening to Jesse Duplantis last night on one of his uh, um, episodes, um, and he talks about when he, he didn't die, but he went to heaven, and he was describing it. People don't want to leave when they get there. So, point number two, we're staying full. Kind of got sidetracked there. But the oil represents the anointing. The lamp represents the word of God, and we need to be watching. So, it's important that we read the word and pray. We need to stay full. And the reason you need to stay full, because when you got saved, the Spirit of God came into you and recreated your spirit. It says that in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says that your spirit has been recreated. It is a new creation, and it is holy in God's image and likeness, created in true holiness, true righteousness. But you as a human being and me as a human being, we leak you, you know, you've been all prayed up and everything, and then I was talking to somebody just this, this past week, and they were talking about how tired they felt because people were just, you know, they were counseling people, and it was just pulling them. I said, you, you leak. You get drained. Just living life, you, give dra you get drained because you're giving out of the life that's in you, whether you realize it or not. Sometimes you don't know why you're so fatigued. You ever been in the kitchen roaming around late at night just looking in the cabinets, looking in the refrigerator, looking for something? And many times I found it's not a physical something, it's a spiritual something that I'm missing. I haven't spent enough time in the Word. I haven't spent enough time praying. And my spirit's hungry. Does that make sense? Does that resonate with anybody? Hallelujah. I grew up with seven brothers and sisters. I have two younger brothers, and my father literally put padlocks on the cabinets at night because my brothers would go out there and roam. And, and they, they'd eat stuff. And when we lived in the woods, I'm telling stories now, uh, because the cabinets were locked up and the refrigerator was locked, they went through the woods and broke into the neighbor's house and ate their cereal. <laughs> I said, you boys are crazy. Uh, all right. Straighten up, Daniel. <laughs> we have to spend time feeding our spirit on the word of God. It is a sustenance. It is nourishment for our spirit. We have to spend time praying because when we pray, it says that we edify ourselves. When we pray in the Holy Ghost, we pray in the spirit that we're working things out. We're building ourselves up upon our most holy faith. We have to stay full of the word of God. So, what was the testimony of these five wise virgins, because there was 10 of them, represents testimony. These five wise ones, they believed 
and they stayed ready, and they stayed full. We have to stay ready. We have to stay full. Point number three, we have to stay busy. Well, Pastor, I stay pretty busy. That's not what I'm talking about. We have to stay busy. Let's turn to the book of Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Matthew, Mark, Luke 19. Back in the old days, right now we'd hear a lot of pages turning, but you can't hear that digital stuff. And so in Luke chapter 19, verse 11, and as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought, <coughs> they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. And he said, therefore, speaking a parable, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for some for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his 10 servants and delivered them 10 pounds. 10 servants, there's that 10 again, testimony. And he gave each one of them a pound and said unto them, verse 13, occupy till I come. Again, if you look up that word occupy, in the Greek, it means to do business, to conduct your life. You're not just sitting around, lounging around. You're busy. But his citizens hated him and sent a message, uh, uh, a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained 10 pounds. You gave me a pound, I got 10 pounds. And he said unto them, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little have thou authority over 10 cities. And the second came saying, Lord, thy pound hath gave five pounds. You gave me a pound, I got five pounds now. He said, good job, man. So now you're gonna be over five cities. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here's your pound, which I kept laid up in a napkin because I feared you because you're an austere man. You take up that, thou, that you've not laid down and you reap that you did not sow. And it says that the Lord said to him, out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere, austere man, taking up that I laid not down and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money unto the bank that at my coming, that at my coming, he's coming, I might have required my own with usury. And he said unto them that stood by, take from him the pound and give it to him that hath 10 pounds. Verse 26, for I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away. But those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Stay busy. He said, occupy till I come. So this is a parable and a metaphor about his second coming. Here's the truth. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, doesn't he? He created the heavens and the universe. It says in the book of John, Gospel of John, chapter one, there's nothing created but what God created it. He owns everything. He knows where all the silver and the gold is. And when he created you and made you, he deposited some things in you. He's given you some things. He's given us his word. He's also when you accepted Christ into your heart, it says that the Holy Spirit shed abroad the love of God into your heart. So you have the love of God, that's in Romans 5, 5. You have the love of God, you've got the word of God, you've got the spirit of God deposited. Here's the thing about God, that everything that he invests in, he expects a return. Just like in this parable, he expected a return. Wouldn't it be a horrible thing for the Lord to return and you go, I'm still here, I'm standing up straight. I got, got everything you gave me. <laughs> That's it? You didn't bring anybody with you? You didn't witness to anybody? You didn't pray for anybody's healing? You didn't lead anybody to the Lord? If I'm just stepping on your toes, just pulling back a little bit. Man, my wife and I had the privilege to pray with some, a couple to accept the Lord a couple Sundays ago right there. I was like, oh my gosh. 
God expects a return on his investment. You are his investment, and he's invested things into you. He's given you certain wisdom, certain skill sets. It's not like he creates you, winds you up, and turns you loose and goes, let's see what they're going to do. The life that you now live, you live because of the, the Son of God. In Colossians chapter 3, it says, you're dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. These are some heavy words. And they might be kind of hard, but it's the truth. Whether I live or die, the scripture says, I belong to the Lord. He expects a return. He wants us to stay busy. Yes, enjoy. He wants you to enjoy life. He created the earth for us to enjoy, to inhabit, to have dominion over. And, and we live in a crazy world right now. I mean, because it says in the last days there's going to be all kinds of craziness, scoffers, people following their own lusts, their own evil desires. But he expects Christians to be busy. Yeah, you get up, you know, you, you mow the grass, you put gas in the car, you go to work, you do those things, staying busy, but busy in the sense of have you been spending time reading the word? Have you been spending time hanging out with God? Have you been spending time praying so that God will send people to you and sometimes he will send you to people? He kind of sneaks up on you like that. And he expects you to take that investment that's in you and share it, your testimony. You may not be called to be a pastor, apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, but you are called to be a witness. We have that commandment from the Lord because he's coming. He wants us to be witness because he's not willing that any should perish. And you can be a witness. It's real easy to be a witness. I've been on the witness stand before. I don't recommend it. It's not a lot of fun. They always make you look like an idiot. But they want to know, what did you see and what did you hear? Tell us. Well, as a Christian, you can do that. You can tell what the Lord's done for you. You can share that with other people. It's real easy. I can share my testimony. I can share how I got saved in my bedroom in 1970 on Saturday night in McGregor, Texas. You can't refute that. I was there. Nobody else was in that room except God because I was getting ready to end my life. I think I was about 14. But he showed up. Because it says, all that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I called on him. In all the knowledge that I had, I called on him. It wasn't some big spiritual prayer. I just called on him. And I was on my knees on the floor. And bless God, he came into that room. And he filled my being with his presence. And my spirit was recreated. So much so that the very next day, Sunday, we're going to church. You know, good Catholics. We went to church. Almost everybody in my family noticed something's different about you. People see a difference in you. They want what you have. Well, hopefully they want what you have if you've been spending time in the Word, if you've been spending time praying, if you've been spending time meditating on the Word, hanging out with God. They want what you got. Because he is coming back. He said he's coming back. And he expects a return on his investment. You are his investment. We need to spend time meditating in the word. That means just keep your mouth shut. Just chew on it, mull it over. We need to be practicing the word, do, you know, doing the word. We need to give the word first place in every situation. What does the word say about this? I was driving down the, the, the road uh, last week and I was going back to the house and I was, it was dealing with the situation. It was quite stressful and I, was, and I thought, okay, I'm just gonna ask the Holy, Holy Spirit, what should I do? I could finish saying, he said, be calm. I thought, I didn't think of that. Because it was very stressful. <laughs> and he's like, be calm. Well, okay. You ever try to practice being calm? But we need to ask him. Hallelujah. Stay busy. Stay busy. And so these wise servants, they believed 
what the Lord said. They stayed ready. They were alert. They stayed full of the word and of the anointing. And they stayed busy. They were living their life. And as you live your life, you just share the love of God. You share the, lo- the light of God. You share anything that God tells you to share with other people. Amen? It's real simple. We also need to, in 1 Thessalonians, it says that we need to live holy. Not unclean, but we need to live holy. 1 Peter 1.15 says, you be holy because I'm holy. You be holy. God said that in the Old Testament, and they're quoting him. You be holy because I'm holy. Well, I can never be holy enough. Well, I got news for you. 2 Corinthians 5.17, when your spirit was recreated, the Holy Spirit recreated your spirit. Your spirit is as holy as it's ever going to be. Because the Holy Holy Spirit dwells in you, lives in you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so when your spirit was recreated, when you were born again, your spirit is holy. Now here's the dilemma. That's a state of being. Spiritually, my state of being is I am holy. But you know what? I still live in this body, and I got to deal with my brain, my mind, my thoughts, and I got to deal with this flesh. Because there's the lust of the eyes, the, the, uh, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, right? And it also says in the scriptures that we have to take every thought captive. So to live holy, I am holy in the eyes of the Lord. I am holy, but I have to live holy. That means I have to set an integrity watch over my thoughts my words and my actions. And I don't know about you, for me, that's, that's kind of hard sometimes. Is this a sobering message? You all seem really quiet. <laughs> we should be excited. He's coming back. But we need to be ready. We need to be full and we need to be about his business. Amen? So how about if I wind it up with... Uh, Second Peter chapter three. Some of you are saying, please do, Pastor, wind it up. Second Peter chapter three. Now I'm reading out of King James. I don't happen to have the New Living Translation on me, but that's a good version to read out of. He says, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you both in which I stir up your pure minds um, by way of remembrance, that you be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, they've died. All things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Don't fall into that slumber. For this they willingly are ignorant of. I'm gonna skip down to... um, Verse 8, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Do you ever wonder why he's waiting? He is so compassionate and so loving and so long-suffering he, doesn't want, he wants everybody to have an opportunity. Has the gospel been preached throughout the entire world? We're getting closer, but not yet. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come, talking about the second coming, as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy living and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, his promise, he said, I will come again. Look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Beloved, See that you look for such things. Be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. The long-suffering of the Lord is salvation. He wants everyone to get saved. Will everybody get saved? No. But he gave us a promise. 
He said, I will come again. Because he went to go prepare a place for you and you and you. And he said, if I do that, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come for you again. Jesse Duplantis tells the, in the, what I just watched last night, the story about when he went to heaven on his way back. The angel was escorting him, and, and the Lord Jesus said, take him by way of the mountains, because Jesse likes the mountains, and, and let him see his house. He's going, I got a house. And he began to describe the house that's there waiting for him, his place. This is not fictitious. This is not a comic book. This is what we live our life by. This is our standard. This is our moral compass. And the Lord Jesus is our Lord, and he is coming back for a glorious church that doesn't have any spot, doesn't have any wrinkle, and is in a state of holiness. Does it mean you're perfect? No. But he expects us to be ready, spiritually alert and awake, aware of the times and the seasons that we live in. He expects us to stay full of his word and of his anointing. And he expects us to be busy. Busy. He expects us to be about the Father's business. It's not just all about you or me. There's things that he's called you to do. And he's, even as I'm speaking to you now, it's coming to your remembrance. It may have been 20 years ago. That's nothing to God. He's still waiting. He's very patient. There's things he's asked you to do for him. There's places he's called you to go, told you to go, people he's called you to talk to, told you to go talk to, things he's told you to stop doing, things he told you to start doing. It's not too late, amen? We're supposed to be about the Father's business. In the Lord's Prayer, we always pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we just live any way we want to. We can't do that. We have to stop that. And so I was reading through my prayer journal. I go back and read through different prayer journals. And, and I was reading in there. The Lord was sharing with me a, a revelation about the future. The future of our planet. The world. And at the end of it, I asked him, I said, Lord, why are, you, why are you sharing this with me? I said, what's my part in this? And this is what he told me. He said, tell them he's coming. Tell them he is coming. Jesus is coming and he is returning. I can't tell you when. But I've been asking more of the Lord, God, what do you want done? And it surprises me because I've, I've not been in the place. I don't know about you. You're probably better than me. But I, I've always prayed about, well, I need this now and I need that. And, and can you pray for that? You know, God, what do you want done? And just this last week, he was telling me, I want you to pray for the world leaders, for calm in the world, for peace in the world, that they stay steady. I don't know what's fixing to happen, but they stay steady. Not to scare you, but they stay steady. And not do something crazy. And God's looking for people to pray. He needs us to pray. He needs you to pray. Ask him what he wants done, amen? And I'll close with this. In the book of Revelation, chapter 22, it says three times in there, Jesus says this, three times. He says, surely... I am coming quickly. Behold, I am coming quickly. I am coming quickly. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I know that we're going to sing here in a minute, so I'm just going to ask you to go ahead and stand up because you've been sitting for a while. I've been talking for a while. And uh, remember, I was going to give you an opportunity because basically, I guess there's uh, two main people that I want to address in here. And those are the people, whether you're watching online or you're here presently, you know, you know whether you're saved or you're not saved. I mean, you can fool other people, but 
but you can't fool God. God knows your heart. He knows the thoughts and the intents of your heart. You're not going to fool him. But God wants you to come into his kingdom. He wants you to be born again. And it, like I said, it's real easy. The book of Romans chapter 10, you can read about it. John 3, 16, you can read that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You have to believe that Jesus came to this earth. He really did live here. He walked on this earth. He lived a sinless, spotless life for you and for me. And he was nailed to that cross. And it says in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 53 that God laid upon him the sins of the world. Your sin, my sin. And he died on that cross for our sins. He took our place. He was buried. And three days later, it says that the Spirit of God raised him. You can read in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, that God used the Holy Spirit to raise Jesus from the dead. Now, it's interesting. Well, I'm not going to go there. That God raised Jesus from the dead for your justification. He was seen by many, many, many hundreds of people after he rose from the dead. And then he ascended into heaven. You can read that in the, in the last chapter of the book of Luke. And then it carries over to uh, Acts chapter 1. It talks about his second coming. And it, he went outside as far as Bethany. He, he lifted his hands up. He blessed his disciples. And, and he was taken up into heaven, into the clouds. And, and disappeared from their sight. And there was two angels standing by. Two angels standing by, and they said, I'm going to paraphrase it. Why are you all standing there gawking? Same way that he was taken from you, he is coming back again. And so the Bible says, I'll reiterate, that if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, for your behalf, that Jesus died for your sins and you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. You say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge you. I know that I need a savior. I need you to come into my heart to forgive me of my sins. I want you to close your eyes right now. This is just between you and God, not between anybody else, between you and God. If that's you here today, just hold your hand up. Hold your hand up. Hallelujah, you wanna ask Jesus to come into your heart. I see those hands, hallelujah, glory to God. So we're gonna pray a real simple prayer. Say, dear God, I come to you, let's all pray. I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and that you raised him from the dead on my behalf. Now, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Make me a new creation. Forgive me of my sins. You said that you would take me in and that you would not reject me. Now, Father God, I believe that I am born again and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to share a real simple truth with you. I'm not personally in any rush to get out of here. You can probably tell that. I'm going to share a real simple truth with you. When you accepted Jesus Christ into your heart and he became your Lord and Savior, you know what? Your hair color did not change. Your physique did not change. Your personality did not change necessarily. That's all still the same. But the Word of God says that you are born again. Your spirit has been recreated and the Spirit of God dwells in you now. And you need to stand on that with confidence. Because the devil, yeah, the devil will try to come along and he'll try to trick you and dupe you into believing nothing really happened, nothing really changed. You still look the same, you still smell the same. But you're different, you're different. And people are gonna notice the change that's in you because there's a light in you now, hallelujah. And there'll be others in here that you've kind of drifted. 
Maybe you fell into that slumber, you know? It says we're supposed to stay awake, we're supposed to stay alert. I just wanna encourage you. The Bible says you need to stir yourself up. You can do that. Well, I don't feel like it. Well, I know you don't feel like it, get over that. It's not about feeling. Many times I go into my prayer house, I get on my knees and I go like, God, I just did this last night. And my flesh is really tired, but I want to be here. So I purpose by an act of my fruit. I choose to praise you. I choose to spend time with you and to hang out with you. It's not based on how you feel. So I'm encouraging you to get over your feelings because they'll, they'll change. You'll feel better after you eat lunch, you know. You'll be right as rain. But if you've fallen into that slumber and you need to get stirred up, stir yourself up. Put on some praise music. Sometimes to, to prime the pump, I just open up the book of Psalms and I just start reading it out loud. Prime the pump. When David and his men went out in, in uh, the Ziklag and they were fighting and stuff and they came back and the enemy had stole everything, their women, their children, all their stuff. They were all crying and groaning, you know, and I probably would have too, but they were talking about stoning David. He's their leader. It said that he had to encourage himself in the Lord. Sometimes you, that all you're going to have is just you. And you've got to encourage yourself in the Lord. Prime that pump. Open the Bible. I don't feel like it. Get over how you feel. It's called walking by faith, not by feelings. Amen? We serve a mighty God. And I know you're tired and you want to get out of here, but I'm going to share a few things with you. I've been seeing this over and over again, and other people have confirmed it to me. I'm telling you, the place that you're at, sometimes you don't realize that you are making history, that you are living in history right now. Some of you are looking at me. All right, some, somebody pull them off the stage. I'm telling you, the Spirit of God is increasing the movement, the presence of God in our services. And the things that I've been seeing in the spirit realm, people flying into San Angelo to come in here to sit in the service, just to sit in the anointing. But the, the Lord's been showing me that it's not like we've done in, in past. You know, we have people come up, and I'm not saying that won't happen, but people are going to get healed sitting right there in their chair in the service. People are going to get set free sitting right there in their chair in the service. People are going to be asking, where in the world is San Angelo, Texas? Because they're going to try to get here. And it's not just this church, but many churches in San Angelo. You need to be encouraged in those facts that he is coming again, and he's coming for a bride that's busy. Busy, full of the word, full of the spirit of God doing the things of God, praying for the sick. It's not, it's not a big thing. It says in, in Mark chapter 16, the believers, believers just lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. If you don't know what to say, just put your hand on them. Bless God. God loves you. You step up to the plate. The Bible says you draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. You step up to the plate in your busyness, in your busy world, pray for people. Lay your hands on the sick. You watch what God will do in your life. Amen? Hallelujah. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Father God, I thank you for blessing your people right now. Lord, I pray for your spirit to come upon them right now. Your holy anointing to come on them right now. I pray that there be a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit, Father God. A fresh anointing. A fresh infilling, Father God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah!